Quantum computing is a piece of technology that is relatively new and a lot of people feel very intimidated by because, you know, they have, feel like you need to know very complex physics or complex math. And well, yes, if you really want to dive in and understand both the hardware and software, you kind of need to know. But if you're just wanting to play around with it, knowing some basic Python and getting familiar with Qiskit is pretty much what you need. But in this video, I'm going to cover some very basic fundamentals of both physics and math required to really kind of get a, a good understanding of what's going on here. And in this video, we're going to specifically be focusing on the math behind qubits, which is very fun. So what are qubits? What's going on? What is this word? So before I jump into explaining what qubits are, allow me to explain what uh, bits are or what the equivalent is for classical computers. And so for classical computers, they have something called bits. And this is binary piece of information. So it's either a one or a zero. And it's how the computer sort of translates information uh, to the screen so we can actually have a functional computer. So how this works is you put in a value, so whether that's typing on your keyboard or pressing a specific uh, something on your screen using a mouse, whatever, we play around with these different functions and what happens is that triggers a string of uh, bits, so ones and zeros, and that kind of is like a code for that specific value. It goes through various transistors and uh, it eventually is um, taken in by the computer, it processes the information, and then it spits something out on the screen that is what you're looking for. So that's how classical computers work. Very, uh, very, you know, revolutionary. We use them all the time. I'm using it to edit this. You're probably using it to watch this. It's, they're using them to watch this. They are literally everywhere. They have changed our world. So you're probably wondering, what is the need for a supercomputer that's able to do a lot more advanced computations? And it's pretty much that it's able to do a lot more advanced computation, but mostly it's able to store and sort of work with a bunch of information at a single time. And you're probably wondering how. <laughs> so this is where qubits come into play. Okay, so what are qubits and how do they store so much information and how do they work and communicate together? So we're not going to focus too much on the how right now. We're going to focus a little bit more on the what. So qubits are essentially the equivalent of bits for quantum computers. They store the information, they are uh, make the computer functional, they are the basis of the computer's um, information. In the uh, classic bits, we have very binary information, so it's either a 1 or 0. For qubits, we sort of have a probability of both 1 and 0 at the same time until we actually measure the value of the qubit and it collapses and it actually is uh, a 1 or a 0. So, what is that? What does that mean? What the heck? Okay, so, so I know that's a little daunting and a little confusing, but we actually, the reason why this is, is because we use something called superposition, which is a very fancy quantum physics idea that if you can't actually know the state of a specific particle until you actually measure it. So to really understand this, there was a thought experiment proposed by a physicist where he essentially put a chemical in a box that had a 50% chance of killing a cat and 50% chance that the cat would be fine. And then you put the cat in the box and then you close the box and you kind of let the cat mingle around with the chemicals. And when the cat is in the box, it has a 50% chance of living and a 50% chance of dying. So we say that it is sort of in a superposition of dying and being alive. And we don't actually know the state of the cat until we actually open the box and we look at the box. So we say it's both dead and alive when the box is closed. Does that make sense? It's pretty, it's kind of, it kind of does make sense because if we don't actually know the specific outcome of something, it's both those outcomes at the same time until we actually know that outcome. So to actually visualize uh, qubits, we can actually use this fancy math uh, equation here. So the math equation uses fancy notation called bra and ket, and this is commonly used in quantum mechanics. And honestly, the notation is not super important to understand for the sake of this video, but just to kind of under, just to know what it is, bra and kets are fancy ways of um, notations to represent vectors in quantum mechanics. So for people who are familiar with linear algebra, which I highly suggest you get familiar with linear algebra if you want to understand the math behind it, then it is kind of replacing the normal hat vector, or the I guess the arrow vector. 
Um, and that, that's actually very important and I'm going to explain it very soon. But before jumping into that, this is kind of how we mathematically represent qubits, but um, we can also visually represent it using something called a block sphere. So for the block sphere, we have a value zero at the top and one at the bottom. And we have like this little like arrow. <laughs> and so the arrows kind of can be wherever. And depending on where it is, we can sort of visually assign a probability of being one or zero or zero or one. And so if it's closer to one, it's gonna have a higher probability of being with one. And if it's closer to zero, it's gonna have a higher probability of um, being, uh, having an outcome of zero. And so that's kind of how the block sphere helps to visually represent this, but obviously that's not how it actually works in the real world. And that's not how quantum computers actually work. We actually have something called quantum system waves. And so that is actually how it works. There are a bunch of waves uh, that represent each qubit. And when we work with different qubits, we have something called interference. So interference is essentially when the waves kind of like hit each other and they like collapse or they collapse, they um, they amplify, they collapse, they do whatever, depending on kind of how the, the waves interact. And then we create this new wave. And from this wave, we're able to actually determine those probabilities. That and also a little bit of math that I'm going to explain. Okay, so you know how I said that the, um, the actual qubits are vector kind of representations and sort of how we have these alpha and beta values in front of them? So those alpha and beta values are actually kind of representing the probability. And you're probably wondering how do we calculate those values using math? So what we can do is we can calculate the inner product of the vectors in the Hilbert space. Okay, so I know that's that's kind of a little bit outside the scope of what's going on, but inner products are actually kind of simple to understand. For anybody who has actually completed a linear algebra class, inner products are essentially like a dot product, but instead of providing a scalar value, we have it in a we have a complex value because the Hilbert space is sort of mapping values in a complex way. And we can actually sort of mathematically represent qubits in the Hilbert space. So a singular qubit is going to have a two-dimensional Hilbert space or be in a two-dimensional Hilbert space. And then a two qubits going to be four dimensions and then it exponentially grows like that. What we can do is we can calculate the inner product. So we do this by essentially taking the brat and the ket and then we kind of do like a little bit of a dot product situation between the two because the ket values they're going to be more of a column vector. The bras are going to be more of a row vector and so we take those, we take those bra and cats, <laughs> and then we kind of do like a dot product. And that gives us this scalar value that is going to be used to find the inner product. And we can actually take that value, we can take the magnitude of the inner product, and we can square it. And that is going to give us the value of a specific outcome, which is really cool. It's really interesting. And it gives us the sort of the probability state. I should also mention that Hilbert space can be in real values as well, but specifically for quantum computing, we're going to be focusing on the co complex uh, Hilbert space. What defines a Hilbert space? What is this situation? Why is it different from a traditional R2, R3, um, or nth dimensional space? There are two main things in a Hilbert space. One, it has to have an inner product. And two, it has to be complete. I already kind of went over what the inner product is, but for the completeness, this is different. If we take vectors in a Cauchy sequence, which means that we take vectors that are slowly, slowly converging into something, and that vector converges into a vector that exists in the space, then we can call it a Hilbert space. Something interesting to note as well is traditional Euclid Euclidean spaces, they are very finite and they can only go to a specific value, whereas the Hilbert space can actually go to an infinite value, which is kind of cool. It is kind of mind boggling to think about it. So that's kind of what the Hilbert space as, as a whole. So I hope that kind of clears up any confusion. So that is it for this video. I really hope that it was helpful to kind of break down all of the sort of basic math and physics in quantum computing. The technology is very interesting and there's a lot of hardware components as well that personally I'm a little less skilled in <laughs> and I, I, but I do find interesting to kind of just like conceptualize or try to conceptualize. So thank you so much for watching. Make sure to subscribe and if you have any questions, leave them in the comments or reach out to me on a different platform. So 